Welcome everybody. My name is Nicole Reagan and I am the founder and CEO of ECMO Resource. We are a community of ECMO specialists from all over the world and um, just sharing resources, information, discussing ideas, experiences, sharing patient stories. And so today I have a special guest with me, a very accomplished physician who is taking care of ECMO patients firsthand. So he's gonna be sharing some information with you and we will do a discussion afterwards. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you a lot for the invitation. For me, it's a pleasure to be here with you and share my, the information I have on the legal spirit I had during BV ECMO and hemodynamic monitoring in, of patients in uh, BV ECMO. Uh, for this presentation, I had the pleasure to work uh, with uh, Dr. Jean-Louis Tebou, Dr. Monica Tukac, and Dr. Madur Kailiko, which uh, many of you should know them for their uh, great experience in the ECMO management and hemodynamic support. So thank you all of them. And uh, thank you to the Korani Pulmonary Institute here in Budapest because they opened the doors and we have a great experience in ECMO and a lot of patients uh, during this COVID-19 pandemic, which allowed to collect more information and learn more about this great word, uh, which is the extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. For this uh, conference, I don't have any conflict of interest. And uh, during this conference, I will try to review the hemodynamic changes during the VV ECMO, which is the typical patient with, we connect to the VV ECMO physical principles of hemodynamic monitoring during BV ECMO. We will speak about the functional hemodynamic monitoring and tools for monitorization. And the proposed uh, method I use specifically for monitoring patients during BV ECMO. To finish the presentation, we will speak about our experience uh, of uh, the, these COVID-19 patients, which are support with BV ECMO. We can see in this slide, the circulatory system is a bit complicated. We need to take into account a lot of variables such as uh, oxygen the transport in the alveoli. We need to take into account the amount of hemoglobin, the cardiac contractility, cardiac afterload, pulmonary afterload, preload, and the metabolic function. And all of these make the circulatory support a bit uh, complex every of the aspects uh, inside the circulatory system have a really important information. And we will review some of them in, during the presentation. At the end, all these circulatory elements are to ensure a good perfusion and to ensure the adequate oxygenation to the most vital organs. It is a balance between the oxygen transport and the oxygen consumption. And for this, as we can see here more easily, there is a lot of variables uh, included, such as uh, saturation, arterial oxygen, hemoglobin, cardiac contractility, heart rate, and per se, the oxygen consumption. The relationship there between the oxygen transport and the oxygen consumption, I think is the main key during the management of the VV ECMO. In normal patients, this ratio should be around five, where it does exceed the balance between transport and consumption. This number can increase in cases where it's a decrease of oxygen extraction or decrease in cases of increased oxygen extraction and going down to the critical tissue epoxia uh, states. When we connect a patient to the extra, uh, extra corporeal life support to the VV ECMO, we are including some extra parameters such as uh, membrane oxygenator and uh, sand dioxide removal and uh, the ECMO uh, flow per se, which act like another heart 
for the patient. This is the, the goal of this is to make our lungs to rest, to heal, and to ensure an adequate oxygen transport to the patient in patients where the lung can't do this work. Also, as we can see here, in usually in this kind of patient, there is a, a high metabolic rate due to septic uh, variables or another variables that can make this balance uh, or play between oxygen transport and oxygen consumption a bit more hard. So when we are including the ECMO to this uh, formula, we need to take into account the Q ECMO, which is the ECMO flow, the gas flow given by the ECMO. And now we have two uh, oxygen transport system, the systemic oxygen transport and the ECMO oxygen transport, which are interdependent each other. If one of them fails, the total oxygen transport fails and we will have an imbalance between the oxygen transport and oxygen consumptions leading to an inadequate uh, perfusion. There is some uh, cases or some uh, articles who said that VV ECMO does not have uh, uh, direct hemodynamic changes in the patient, which is uh, really not true. The last studies when compared the hemodynamic of these patients before ECMO initiation and after ECMO initiation uh, revealed that uh, there is real hemodynamic change that we need to take into account in our patients. The first of that is the increase in the global, global end diastolic volume. As we will know, the global end diastolic volume is essentially preload. And the other really important parameter is an increase in the extravascular lung water, which is the fluid accumulated in the interstitial and the alveolar space in the lung. We need to take this into account if enough patients because we will not have uh, every patient with the normal he uh, healthy cardiac uh, uh, for function. We can have patients with uh, already a chronic health failure we, have a, we can have a patient with an advanced uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, which already can have a uh, high uh, ratio of uh, ex, uh, uh, lung permeability. And the increase in the global end diastolic volume and an increase on extravascular lung water when we initiate the VV ECMO can lead to increase of risk of pulmonary oedema. There is an also uh, another change in the hemodynamics in the patient after connecting the VV ECMO. And I think this one is uh, really good for our patients, especially for patients with uh, uh, pulmonary hypertension and acute respiratory syndrome. Uh, which is the substantial reduction in the mill pulmonary artery pressure. This was seen as, uh, as I so told in patients before comparing before and after the initiation of the VV ECMO. And uh, as my chief in the Korani hospital tells, she saw with the pulmonary artery catheter several times in the operating room, how the mean pulmonary artery pressure decreases really much after initiation of the VV ECMO. So uh, resuming uh, some of the hemodynamic changes during VV ECMO, in less war, we can say the VV ECMO can reduce the afterload, the pulmonary vascular resistance, the mean pulmonary pressure and the systemic vascular, re uh, vascular resistance, increase the preload, and may decrease the ventilatory pressure if we are using lung protective strategy, which is the goal when we are using VV ECMO, but sadly is, uh, it does not happen uh, all the time. Indication for VV ECMO, there is a lot. We can have indication for patients with acute respiratory distress syndrome, 
patients with uh, airway obstruction, with uh, smoke inhalation, patients ongoing to lung transplantation, patients with COPD with uh, high SN dioxide retention, which cannot be treated with uh, normal ventilatory support, uh, patients post cardiotomy, uh, patients with ref respiratory, refractory respiratory failure, et cetera. Uh, indication for a VVA move, there is lot so there is lot uses for this uh, strategy, strategy for oxygenization. But the, the typical patient in the ICU, we use uh, the VV ECMO is this patient usually in sepsis, especially now in this COVID pandemic. It's a patient with a perfusion oxygenization mismatch with a long reduced compliance, several high, uh, severe hypoxemia, high intrathoracic pressure, which can increase the risk of uh, uh, lung injury, interstitial oedema, and this uh, stretching and overinflation of the alveology and this VQ mismatch can uh, also lead the formation for uh, capillary stress failure. So it's not the, the easy patient we are getting to the VV ECMO. As well, this patient we are connecting to yet ECMO usually have high metabolic demand, especially septic patients with pulmonary congestion, high pulmonary pressures. They can have right ventricular failure or reduced cardiac output, uh, vasoconstriction with uh, posterior circulatory failure and vasodilatation uh, due to sepsis or septic shock. And these uh, pressure volume variables in these patients can make the fluid status and fluid responsiveness prediction ability a bit uh, difficult for us in the ICU. There is also the mechanical ventilation parameters which can lead to hemodynamic changes. The tidal volume is a really important parameter which can lead to a decrease or increase in the cardiac output due to the increase or reduce of the transpulmonary pressure. This pressure, as we know, is transmitted to the pericardium and can lead or limit the cardiac output, the afterload and the preload. Also, the large uh, uh, pressure in the thorax can lead to an increase in the size of the inferior vena cava, and this can give us a false negative when we are assessing volume in these patients with uh, high intrathoracic pressures. The inspiratory inspiratory ratio, as we well know, as well can have a, a big importance in the hemodynamic because a prolonged expiratory time can improve venous return, but usually in these patients with uh, severe hypoxemia, we are using an inverse inspiratory expiratory ratio uh, to improve the oxygenization, and this can lead in the other side to reduce the venous return and affect the cardiac output. The prone position, we need to speak about the prone position because as well as a technique used to improve oxygenization, especially in uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome patients. The prone position in the first house can lead to a reduction of the venous return, especially in patients with uh, hypovolemia. But after, thanks use to the reduce of the intrathoracic pressure, this can be normalized and after one hour do and give an increase in the cardiac output and the oxygen delivery, decreasing the pulmonary shunt. The PEEP is another parameter we need to take into account when we are evaluating hemodynamics. The high PEEP can reduce the right ventricular preload and increase the pulmonary vascular resistance, and this can reduce the cardiac output also can increase the right ventricular afterload leading to right ventricular failure. And as we will know, we, we have, when we have a high PEEP, this can enlarge the inferior vena cava diameter 
leading us again to a false negative uh, when we are evaluating the volemia state in the patient. We know all this table. This table is about many hemo uh, shock states we can find in the critical, critical care patients the hypovolemic obstructive uh, distributive kind of shock. All of them are an imbalance in transport and consumption of oxygen, and all of them have a different hemodynamic profile. These make us really important to evaluate the, all, the, all the hemodynamic uh, parameters to give a more precise diagnose and assess for patient. So as we can realize now, uh, VBE ECMO is not that does not have any effect on hemodynamics. Uh, VBE ECMO is not just like connect and forget because the VBE ECMO is totally hemodynamic dependent. If uh, there is something alteration in the patient hemodynamics, we will have this reflected in a poor efficiency on or hemodynamic support. When we check the goals of the VV ECMO, first we check the protective ventilation. We need to leave the lung to rest. And this is easy. We, need, we have to reduce the tidal volume, limited the plateau pressure, limiting the driving pressure, trying to limit in the PEEP the fuel to trying to limit it, the mechanical power in order to obtain, obtain an adequate uh, oxygen transport and saturation and reduce the uh, sand dioxide values. But when we check the hemodynamic goals, there is only one and says the oxygen transport, oxygen consumption index should be between three and seven. And we say, okay, it's just that, but it's not so easy. As we will know in septic state, there is a high metabolic rate to the septic state and we will need a larger, we will have a larger oxygen consumption. And this is why we can't just uh, calculate the oxygen transport. And if we say, okay, I have a good oxygen transport, why my patient is not have an adequate oxygenation? This is due because the high metabolic rate due to the septic state is increasing the oxygen consumption and you are not in the goal of the, or the balance between the transport and the consumption. So we have a really interdependent and dependent system between the systemic oxygen transport and the ECMO oxygen transport. And that's why we need to, we will show you how to assess these uh, parameters in order to get the balance and a better balance between the interdependent ECMO systemic oxygen transport and the patient oxygen consumption. We have here uh, two examples of uh, we can see in our daily practice. If we have one patient with a uh, high metabolic rate, constant, constant high oxygen consumption, and is connected to VV ECMO with a constant flow, means we have a constant oxygen supply. But if the patient is hypovolemic, maybe we will have increase in heart rate an increase in cardiac contractility. So this patient in the first phase can be with hypertension and then hypotension. And we will see the venous saturation low, maybe be normal depending on the state we have. But we will realize that the saturation is not in our goals. And this is due to a decrease in the oxygen transport. So our ratio between the transport and the consumption will not be balanced as, uh, and as a result, we will have a uh, low uh, oxygen uh, transport. In the second state, we have a distributive shock or more common the septic shock. 
which uh, we, if we have patient, again, high metabolic rate, but constant uh, ECMO oxygen supplies, and the systemic uh, circulatory system have an increase or decrease in the heart rate with the first hyperdynamic uh, contractility status with high oxygen saturation, we will have an imbalance again between the transport and the consumption, and this will lead to a decrease in the uh, saturation or the oxygen perfusion. So if we want to know where we are and what we can do, we need to do precision medicine. The functional hemodynamic monitoring is uh, not new and help us to assess the dynamic interaction, interactions between all the hemodynamic the variables to respond more precisely to what we need to treat and why. These increase the ability to define the cardiovascular state of the patient, predict the response and give the uh, more precise therapy in the moment they need or not give some therapy in order to avoid complications. There are several tools for hemodynamic monitorization. The gold standard for hemodynamic monitorization, as we know, is the pulmonary artery catheter, the Swan GANS, but have something restriction. Uh, we have this uh, pulmonary artery catheter we know is expensive. The second is really invasive. And it's right in the literature that may have something uh, effect of the extracorporeal uh, circulation with the pulmonary blood flow and decrease uh, the effectivity of the pulmonary artery catheter to measure the cardiac output and some uh, and the afterload parameters. Uh, Still, the pulmonary artery catheter is the most uh, recommend, one of the most recommended, but it should be initiated before catheterization of the ECMO. And we need to assess the amount of regurgitation we can have in during the uh, extracorporeal support, because the greater the amount of recirculation, the greater the amount of error we can get uh, when we are monitoring with the pulmonary artery catheter. The next one is the transpulmonary terminal dilution monitors. These are volumetric parameters and they as well with the, because of the same mechanism can get a bit inaccurate uh, when we are in the extracorporeal life support, when we are in the VV ECMO. The, the greater the amount of, re, of recirculation will make a greater the possibility to get errors or the need to recalibrate the, the monitor in order to get better results. The other monitors are those with arterial pulse wave analysis. Uh, I don't know if yesterday you could see the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine webinar about tool of monitorization. Uh, these uh, are really great monitors when we have stable patient, but where we have when we have a patient with uh, greater changes in systemic vascular resistance, uh, they can lose the precision to measure the cardiac output. So are not the more suitable to monitorize these patients in uh, VV ECMO. At last, we have the echocardiography. The echocardiography is a great tool, especially if you are trained and you, are re you can repeat the ultrasound in your patients. You can measure in bedside the cardiac output and all the hemodynamic variables you need to assess to treat your patient. But uh, there is uh, some lows as well. The, as we will know, the echocardiography is uh, high operator dependent and the author, you cannot monitorize continuously the patient. If you have a large amount of patients like we have now, thanks to the COVID-19, then it could be really hard to do uh, three ultrasounds by day per patient. 
So it's a really good tool, but have its limitations as well. Now we're going to assess the hemodynamic parameters. We know our goal is to maintain a balance between the oxygen transport and an oxygen delivery with a ratio between three and seven. For that, we need to assess the cardiac output. We need to assess the pressure of arterial oxygen, the hemoglobin, the saturation, and the venous oxygen. When, for that, you know, the cardiac output depends on contractility, depends on preload, and depends on afterload. To assess the preload, we have three main variables. The first is the central venous pressure. We all know the central venous pressure is a static barometric parameter and it's a bit hard to assess because we need to observe over the time and the values can change regarding the twin thoracic pressures and the cardiac previous states. It's not the same to evaluate a central venous pressure of a patient with a normal right ventricular diameter or left ventricular diameter than a patient with uh, chronic hypertension or chronic heart disease. And that can make the evaluation of preload who's using central venous pressure alone uh, really difficult. The next one is the right, right ventricular and left ventricular end diastolic area. In absence of the global end diastolic volume using the volumetric uh, monitors, this can be a really good tool to assess and you can use it the transthoracic or the transesophageal ultrasound to assess these two parameters. They are bit size. There is not much variables that can change the value or predicted value of these two parameters. So these are really good uh, parameters to assess preload. The next one and really popular is the inferior vena cava diameter. It became really popular because it's really easy to assess. You can just mm, place your probe in the abdomen of the patient and using the M mode on the B mode, you can assess the diameter of the inferior vena cava and the variation during inspiratory or respiratory uh, uh, times, but uh, in patients with acute respiratory syndrome, in patients with BB ECMO, this can be a bit challenging because we need to, we have a patient with high uh, thoracic pressure and this can lead to an enlargement of the inferior vena cava diameter. So as well as the central venous pressure, you need to measure the inferior vena cava diameter if it's possible, before the patient gets into VV ECMO, before the patient gets into uh, invasive uh, mechanical ventilation, to know your patient, to know which are the normal values, and later checking every day uh, the inferior vena cava diameter to know when is a real significant change in the diameter, if you are going up or if you are going down. And if you, are, you can really use it do you measure volume responsive or not? When now we are going to preload responsiveness, as we will know, having a low preload doesn't mean you will have an adequate preload responsiveness. That's why we need to measure these dynamic uh, parameters. And the most used ones are the pulse pressure variation and stroke volume variation the inferior vena cava diameter variation and the passive leg rising. The pulse pressure variation and the stroke volume variation, we can assess using the transpulmonary trans thermodilution uh, monitors or using the echocardiography. They are really easy to assess and help us really much because using these two, we can measure as well after low calculating the uh, dynamic arterial elastans. However, we need to take into account that due to a uh, uh, protective mechanical ventilation or ultra protective mechanical ventilation, we can reduce uh, really much the transpulmonary pressure. And these two variables 
depends on the transpulmonary pressure variations in order to predict the preload responsiveness. There is a study when, where they change the index at the pulse pressure variation to the transpulmonary pressure and they got uh, good results, but there is only two or three studies that say that we can do this in the intensive care medicine. The next one is the inferior vena cava variation. As I told before, the inferior vena cava diameter have something variations in this patient with uh, high transthoracic pressure when it's a distension of the vena cava inferior. So maybe we will not have, we will not see the uh, diameter variations in these patients. As well, as we are losing the transpulmonary pressure in low and, in, and ultra protective uh, mechanical ventilation, we will not see clearly the, the variation of the diameter of the inferior vena cava giving us a fails negative. So this lead us to the last uh, variable is the, or technique is the passive leg rising. Uh, this is really easy to do. You can do it as many times as you can. Uh, just you can do it if a patient have rise at the tracheal pressure, but I think this is not the most common situation you have in patients with VP ECMO. It's really easy. You can assess the uh, passive leg rising technique and measure the cardiac output by ultrasound or using the volumetric uh, monitors, and you can uh, do it in your patient with ECMO. It's really easy to do. I think it's one of the most uh, uh, useful techniques to assess preload responsiveness in patients during VVACMO support. Now we are moving to the afterload. For afterload, we have two main parameters. It's a systemic vascular resistance that we can calculate using the echocardiography, using the PICO, or using the swan GANS. The, this is really important parameter because the changes in the system in vascular resistance can tell us before the patient has hypotension that he will go to the to a cardiogenic shock or we are giving too much something medication that can cause vasodilatation. The dynamic arterial elastance is a relatively, relatively new uh, parameter. For this one, you need the stroke volume variation and the pulse pressure variation is a really nice parameter because can help you in patients with uh, vasopressor support to know when you can reduce the vasopressor therapy without having later a reduction in the mean arterial pressure. When we want to assess the contractility, so the main parameter, as we will know, is the cardiac output and the cardiac index. These uh, two parameters are really important in the hemodynamic management of every uh, intensive care patient, and especially in patients during ECMO support, because we need to know which is the percentage of cardiac output we are supporting with the VV ECMO. It's recommended more than 60% of support and if there is a reduction in this percentage of support, it can be because their patient is in a hyperdynamic state or we have a patient in the cardiac failure. The cardiac power index is one of the best parameters to uh, assess the cardiac systolic function as well It's really easy. You just need the blood pressure and uh, echocardiography or just the PICO to uh, uh, calculate this parameter. And the left ventricular ejection fraction is uh, really easy to assess as well using the echocardiography, but it used in intensive care medicine can be a bit controversial because some people still assessing just using the um, Tayshield formula, some are using volumetric, maybe the windows are not the most adequate to assess ejection fraction, 
the ejection fraction compared patient to patient, and then you have this percentage if it's adequate, not adequate. You need to know which is the basal uh, ejection fraction for your patients to know if it's going up or going down. One of the really important, I think most of the, one of the most important parameters you need to assess is perfusion. The first parameter is the mean arterial pressure, which is in the guidelines as one of the parameters to guide if you have an adequate perfusion. However, this uh, can be controversial in patients uh, with uh, high demand of uh, high metabolic demand of, or patient with hypervolemic state because maybe the 65 uh, good point for mean arterial pressure can be a bit low for this kind of patients. For this reason, there is another um, parameter is the mean perfusion pressure, which is mainly used to assess the kidney perfusion pressure. I think this parameter helps help us really much. It is indexed by the central venous pressure, which is allowed us to know in these patients with uh, in high central venous pressure, if we are getting enough uh, mean arterial, we mean, um, if we have an enough uh, perfusion pressure. Uh, we can see in patients with maybe normal mean arterial pressure, but low mean perfusion pressure, that the other perfusion uh, parameters such as urine output or lactide can increase even if we have an adequate mean arterial pressure. And this leads us to the next parameter, which is the urine output. In normal situations, normal ICU, this parameter can be really easy to assess. Bedside, you can check hour by hour if the urine output is going down and maybe can tell us that the patient is getting low with the uh, fluids. But uh, in the actual situation with COVID patient and when we don't have enough uh, personnel to check uh, every hour the urine output, I think it can be really hard to assess in these uh, actual situations. The lactate is a well, a really great parameter to know if we are in the low perfusion state. However, if you can see every day if your patient, sometimes you get patient getting into shock with tachycardia and constant reduction of the uh, blood pressure, reduction in the urine output, and still the lactate is 2, 2.3, 1.8, and uh, after a few hours, then you can see a um, significant increase in the lactate. So maybe in certain situations, the lactate can be a slow uh, parameter to assess because the, the slow increase in, as well, we need to do lot blood gases, blood gases to, to measure this uh, parameter. The last but not least is the central venous saturation. Uh, this, uh, as we will see, the venous saturation can be really difficult to interpret, and we need to assess together with the sand dioxide uh, change, uh, the carbon dioxide changes, to really know where we are in the hemodynamic status of the patients. We, will, we cannot forget the right ventricle especially in patients with VV ECMO due to an increase in the global end diastolic volume and increase in the extravascular lung water. Uh, there is report of uh, right ventricular patient, uh, failure in patients with acute respiratory distress syndrome in patients with COVID-19. So we cannot forget the right ventricle. There is uh, four main uh, variables that we can measure bedside to know if we have an adequate right ventricular function. The first one is the TAPSE, it's really easy to use. You can use by echocardiography and we, you can follow up really easily. The second one is the fraction area change for the right ventricle is like the left ventricle ejection fraction for the right ventricle. It's really easy to assess as well if you have a good acoustic window. 
and there is these two new parameters which have which are the right ventricle to left ventricle diameter ratio which is a good predictor of right ventricular failure and is actually used for patient with acute uh, embolar, uh, pulmonary embolism. The last one is the capsid to pass or pulmonary systolic uh, pulmonary artery pressure. It's a really good predictor for right ventricular failure, but as you will know, you need a really good window to measure the pulmonary artery systolic uh, pressure. Now speaking uh, more about the venous oxygen saturation, uh, we have it bed size because the ECMO can measure continuously the uh, venous oxygen saturation. However, we need to assess together with other hemodynamic parameters because we can have a reduction of the uh, venous saturation and they can be because of higher metabolic rate and higher oxygen consumption, but as well, a reduction in the oxygen transport. As well, we can have an increase of the venous saturation, and this can be because an increase of the oxygen transport or a reduction of, of oxygen consumption. And these four states have different therape therapeutic approaches. So we cannot see along the venous oxygen saturation. We need to measure and other parameters to assess bulimia, to assess uh, cardiac contractility, to assess uh, ventilatory support, uh, to assess hemoglobin, to assess the hypot hypothermia or fever in this patient. So don't check only the venous saturation. We have tools. And if we are going to build something, we can't use only one tool. The more tools we have, the more easy to build our house. We can see here, there is a normal value of uh, central venous saturation and the increase or the increase of the central venous saturation can lead into an increase in mortality. So uh, don't watch it alone, but keep an eye on it. Now, how we can do every day or during an acute emergency in the ICU to check all these parameters and why we can check all these parameters, why, what's the clinical importance and how we can do it every day. Uh, there is, as we know, an interdependent uh, correlation between the systemic and the uh, ECMO oxygen transport, but the first change we will say we will see every day in the patient when we, there is an alteration in the oxygen transport is the PO, PaO2 and the oxygen saturation. We will see even before we can do ultrasound, even before we can check in every monitor any alarm, we will see there is a reduction in the patient saturation. We have patients with 80% saturation, and suddenly we have patients with 60 saturation. That means something is happening and means we need to check our patient, do an ultrasound or check the hemodynamic monitoring and know what's wrong. What's wrong is the transport or is wrong, or is wrong the uh, consumption. In my daily monitoring, I have a checklist. Always first check your patient, the level of sedation and analgesia, if the patient is bleeding, if an adequate, uh, adequate chest recoil, no pneumothorax, then check the ventilator, if it's some asynchrony, if it's adequate in lung mechanics, because all of these can, as we can check, check before, they have a interaction with the hemodynamics and then check your ECMO. Check the ECMO pressures, check the venous oxygen, check the hemoglobin, check the pre-membrane, post-membrane oxygen and send the oxid and then assess your hemodynamics. 
In the hemodynamics, we have the general hemodynamics, which are the heart rate and the blood pressure. We have the pH and the CO2. After we assess the perfusion, because we saw normal heart rate, relative is normal, uh, blood pressure, the pH is in normal range, the sand, dio uh, the sand dioxide is in good state. So we assess perfusion. We can check the urine output, checking the NORS uh, uh, papers, checking bedside, how is the urine, if it's going down, if it's going up, if you can see the urine is a bit dark, check the mean perfusion pressure, calculate the cardiac transport, check the saturation, the venous saturation, and check the lactate values. If it's going up, if it's going down, it stays normal. Check the skin of your patient, if you had motlet skin, if it's going cyanotic, if it's normal perfusion in the fingers. And then you can assess your preload. You can use statics preload if you know your patients really well. If you know my patient after initiation of ECMO have a normal inferior vena cava diameter of 18 millimeters. If you see suddenly the patient have 13 millimeters, 15 millimeters, so that can give you alert that something is happening, maybe it's going to hypovolemia, same with the central venous pressure. If it's be better, if you can assess the dynamic parameters, and then you can get better assess of the preload state of your patient. Then if the patient you can see is in the hypovolemic status, so you need to give you think you need to give volume, then uh, you measure the preload responsiveness. You measure using the ECS, which is the passive leg rising, or you want to measure the pulse pressure variation. You want to index the pulse pressure variation to the transpulmonary pressure variation, or you will measure by stroke volume variation or the occlusion of the uh, end expiration tube, that's your choice. And But you know when you can do it, when you can't use it. Then check your heart function. Check, don't forget your right ventricle function. Then calculate the left ventricular cardiac function and then assess your afterload. Any parameters you can get. I included here the diastolic blood pressure because it's really easy to assess if you see patient which is going tachy with tachycardia and uh, then they start reducing the diastolic blood pressure and you see the patient maybe is uh, hypovolemic or going to hypovolemia, but it's not preload responsiveness with the low di uh, diastolic blood pressure, then you need to start thinking about using of vasopressors. Don't forget to assess your oxygenation, your hemoglobin concentration, the arterial content of oxygen, and then you can come all together and check the relationship between the transport and the oxygen consumption. And uh, don't forget the uh, amount of uh, sand dioxide uh, removal by ECMO to adjust your uh, flow gas. And in patients with ECMO, I did this uh, table together with Dr. Tebul, and it's easier to assess if you have your patient awake, hyperdynamic, hypovolemic, anemic, septic, of which pulmonary oedema, then you have these uh, hemodynamic parameters and the relationship. And this will help you to guide your treatment. It's really important that I included here the awake patient because sometimes the sedation level is not adequate. This patient maybe can have a good uh, muscle relaxation and don't be uh, asynchronic in the mechanical ventilation, but awake. And this will lead to something kind of hyperdynamic state with uh, high blood pressure, high heart rate, that will increase the systemic cardiac output and this will lead to a reduce in the ECMO support and of course to a reduction in the oxygenation and the oxygen transport. Uh, the hypovolemic patient is one of the most, uh, uh, I think one of the most uh, 
uh, states we will see every day because these patients with uh, high metabolic rate, high oxygen consumption require big, larger amounts of fluids. Anemic patients in the patient with VV ECMO, that's why we are checking the hemoglobin every hour to check if there is reduction. We need to check if uh, there is a, we, we have a, an adequate uh, clotting time, an adequate uh, uh, amount of heparin, and uh, if there is no reduction of uh, hemoglobin due to alterations in the coagulation system. Septics in patients with COVID-19, with ARDS, this is the everyday, especially when they are coming to the ICU in septic, going to septic shock. The hemodynamics are really important, especially to give or not give fluids and where to, when to start the vasopressor. And uh, pulmonary edema is really important as well, as we can, as we saw in the previous slides, the ECMO do, uh, goes to an increase in the global end diastolic volume, an increase in the uh, extravascular lung, lung water, and this can lead in a patient with the reduced contractility or uh, reduced cardiac function easily to get pulmonary edema. That's why we need to assess the preload responsiveness and the preload to know which patient needs how much fluid. So in the acute setting, uh, the first we will see is a drop in the oxygen saturation. So it's normal. We are in the ICU and the North Colas that the patient saturation went from 80 to 60 or 50. So what we need to know first, check your patient. Don't forget to touch your patient, to see your patient, to smell your patients, to hear your patients. You need to check the level of sedation or analgesia. If there is bleeding somewhere, adequate chase recall. You can do x-rays or lung ultrasound to know if the patient have pneumothorax or not the adequate placement of the endotracheal tube, there is no air leaking, then check the ventilator, adequate lung mechanics, no asynchrony, no changes in the transpulmonary pressures, the inspiratory maximum pressure, the plateau pressure, the tidal volume. You need to check all of this at first. Then check your ECMO lines that there is no kinks, Check your venous pressure, if it's high, then you can check the uh, volemic status, check the transmembrane uh, pressure, if it's high or not, check your ven uh, ECMO line, if there is no pop chatter or there is pop chatter, and think if it's patient position or if due to hypovolemia or moving of the lines, and uh, check the post-membrane gas to know because not always you will have a uh, increase in the transmembrane pressure due to clotting. Sometimes the first uh, sign you will have of a malfunction or dysfunction of the oxygenation membrane is a high, uh, a reduction of the post-membrane oxygen, 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 and this will lead, of course, uh, a reduction of the oxygen delivery by ECMO. Then assess your hemodynamics, check your heart rate, check your cardiac output, check the relationship between the cardiac output and the ECMO flow, which is the percentage, if it's adequate, if it's how the range you were thinking in the morning. So I was thinking this patient should have between 60 and 65, um, if there has increased, why this happened? If it's a uh, reduced, why this happened? Share the hemoglobin, the arterial oxygen uh, of uh, arterial content of oxygen. Check the preload. Don't forget the preload responsiveness. Then you can check the afterload. Sometimes the first phase of uh, a septic shock, if an if an increase of a uh, heart rate and increase in the afterload and this can lead to a reduce uh, in your ECMO support. Check the cardiac function, check the contractility, 
and at the end, of course, check the uh, transport, uh, oxygen transport and oxygen consumption ratio to know where you are, how much far you are from your goal. And uh, this is a bit extended now table because I include the ventilatory asynchrony. Sometimes you are at 1 a.m., uh, you have only two nurses for the entire ICU with uh, 12 ECMO patient, patients, six of them using vasopressor, some using inotropes, and uh, maybe you are not more with the uh, muscle relaxation or patient can be awake and there is a ventilatory asynchrony. So you need to check the ventilatory asynchrony and adjust the ventilatory parameters and algo sedation and muscle relaxation in order to uh, synchronize again the patient with the ventilatory support because the intrathoracic pressure changes can lead to hemodynamic changes and decrease the amount of uh, oxygen delivery helped by the ECMO. All these um, ventilatory changes during ECMO or during uh, acute respiratory syndrome and the lung mechanics, we can check it in the future uh, conference, a future meeting. I'm open if you want me to help you with this, but it's really important, don't forget, these patients in ECMO support are connected to mechanical ventilatory support and any changes you do in your mechanical ventilations will lead to changes in your hemodynamics. Something uh, really uh, normal prevalent in the ICU, if you had this patient uh, with acute desaturation, maybe a patient with previous uh, hypertension, which uh, have tachycardia, high blood pressure, is no hypovolemic, have adequate sedation, no fever, not acute elevation of lactate, um, good hemoglobin, the ECMO parameters and the ventilatory support is uh, unchanged and normal. And this is just in a hyperdynamic state and the use of beta blockers can help you in these cases. This is a uh, real life ICU daily uh, information collecting from the ICU. This is especially one of the patients I choose for these slides. Here in blue, you can check the basal states I got from the patient with an acute uh, reduction of the oxygenization. You can see the PO2 was around 50. The patient have tachycardia, high blood pressure, and also an acute reduction of the uh, oxygen pressure, um, oxygen fraction delivery ratio. And after the use of the beta blocker, you can see an improvement of the blood pressure, of the cardiac contractility parameters, of the oxygenization and the oxygen transport, oxygen consumption ratio, only using beta blockers. But before starting beta blockers, you need to be sure that the patient is in hyperdynamic status, and this is measuring the hemodynamic parameters. This is my way to simplify the work in the ICU. Uh, sadly, we don't have a PICO, we don't have a pulmonary artery catheter. I am doing the hemodynamic monitorization using transthoracic echo. Sometimes it's a bit hard, sometimes it's easier. And then I download all my information in this uh, application where I can measure all the hemodynamic and lung mechanic parameters to do my daily practice. Uh, um, uh, choices. This uh, is uh, the advanced version. There is a basic version that will be soon available in the European Society of Cardiology webpage and maybe in the European Society of Intensive Care and Medicine webpage for all of you to assess. It will have the basic hemodynamic parameters for contractility, preload, preload responsiveness, and ECMO support. And the advanced version will come a bit later after or get, more, get smart study in an application version. Uh, 
Uh, at the end, also don't forget we can have arrhythmias. It's, uh, wow, we can see atrial fibrillation maybe in the two from five patients connecting to ECMO, maybe more in patients with acute respiratory syndrome and septic shock, even more in these patients that have a, a acute, kidney, acute kidney failure. So we need to first check if it's real atrial fibrillation. Only because the monitor is giving tachycardia doesn't mean it's uh, uh, atrial fibrillation and we are not going to run for amiodarone or cardioversion. We need to check why is the atrial fibrillation. Don't forget the main causes are metabolic due to a reduction or increase in the pH due to hypovolemia, changes in natrium, calium, toxins, drugs, hypoxemia, pneumothorax, lung edema, and more and more and more. So if you have a patient with uh, an acute onset of atrial fibrillation, first assess all the possible causes. And if there is no possible causes related, you can change in that moment, then start antiarrhythmics. Not before, because use the uh, antiarrhythmics is extra drugs, is extra complications for the patient in the future, and it's more work for the nurses as well. Don't forget that. Now, I think this is one of the points everyone wanted to, to see is what about ECMO and COVID-19. Uh, the use of ECMO uh, in COVID-19 patient is going up and up every day. Every day we can see the charts. There is more ECMO connected to uh, more COVID-19 patient connected to ECMO support. And this is due because the ECMO can help us really much to reduce the cardiac oxygen to let or long to rest and to improve the oxygenization of the patient a bit easier and without uh, the mechanical ventilation that can lead if you are using high ventilatory parameters. But uh, we need to consider that uh, the initiation of uh, ECMO support in patients with COVID-19 is related to several uh, conditions. These conditions can be related to the time of the onset of the uh, respiratory distress syndrome initiation. It can be related to the center which is sending the patient or the center which is receiving the patient. For example, sadly, we cannot receive patient with the high body mass index because the limitation of the cannulas we have in the ICU, uh, the more delayed to start the VV ECMO, the higher the rate of failure in the, and higher mortality. So we need to, to have uh, receive, we can receive patient with more than three or two weeks uh, in the uh, high ventilatory parameters with a long time uh, respiratory uh, failure because this will not improve the patient condition and we will not see a uh, patient getting better. When we are going then to the uh, ECMO supporting COVID-19 patients, the guideline, the recommendations due to ECMO dynamics, there is no too much information. They are just telling that use echocardiography to assess cardiac failure, but uh, there is no information about monitorization. There is no too much information about goals. The mainly ECMO goals you can see is just in the ECMO books and uh, ECMO general guidelines. So there is not much information about hemodynamics. That's why we are here helping. And that's why we collect all this information for you. And uh, about COVID-19 and uh, uh, cardiac function, there is no also too much information. There is high rate of uh, uh, sign of right ventricular failure, but I saw as well, and. I, some of the clinicians I'm uh, speaking frequently, they saw that uh, there is a change in the left ventricular and diastolic index area. 
And as uh, we commented before, this is a good dynamic parameter to assess preload. And that means that we need to know this information because again, we can get, get false negative information about preload is if uh, we are thinking about uh, normal values of left ventricular and diastolic area for assessing preload in these patients. This patient can have an enlarged left ventricle and be hypovolemic. And that means we need to assess our patient before starting ECMO, if it's possible, before uh, initiation of uh, invasive mechanical ventilation to know if uh, which is the normal for this patient, the normal value of left ventricular and diastolic area. There is a large registry in patients with uh, VV ECMO and COVID-19. Uh, as we can see, then the mortality increases for the amount of days of delay of initiation of mechanical of uh, ECMO support. However, there is hope. We have uh, this patient, this was a really beautiful case. This patient uh, start, came to our ICU after two weeks in invasive ventilatory support with high values. He was, he, he's young. Uh, he have more than 80 A's in VV ECMO support. We have here the x-rays the day of the cannulation with the VV ECMO. And uh, in the left side, the x-rays after the uh, VV ECMO support, the day we remove, uh, we did uh, remove from the ECMO. This patient is alive. This patient is now in the internal medicine the ward, is recovering. Uh, is good mood, uh, the neurology status is perfect. Of course, the weakness regarding the large amount of uh, uh, muscle relaxation he needed. He was, uh, it was really hard case. Uh, the hemodynamics went up and down, the support went up and down. It was really hard, but a really beautiful case and a really beautiful success. And we are glad this patient is well and safe and smiling again with his family. So means there is hope. Sometimes the, there is people going outside the statistics and that's why maybe we are not going to be replaced by the machines soon, so, so soon. So this is ECMO. Uh, maybe ECMO does not cure COVID-19, does not cure our patient, but really, ECMO help to save person's life. Here there is some reference uh, we check for this conference, all available for you. So you can recheck and expand the, your knowledge about this uh, beautiful subject. And uh, it was really large presentation. I'm sorry for all the inconvenience. Sorry, I'm sorry we couldn't do this in the live uh, uh, Zoom uh, webinar because of something hacking, but here we are. This is just watching by the keyhole. There is a whole world of hemodynamics, a lot of uh, more tools and parameters we can assess to get uh, more precise uh, diagnostic and treatment. So I hope you will be curious and check a bit more and after we can speak about more advanced, more complex parameters in patients with VV ECMO. Thanks a lot for your patience. Thanks a lot for your attention. And here is my email so you can reach me if you have uh, any questions. Thank you so much, um, doctor. That was such a, a fantastic presentation, um, full of a lot of uh, information that's so helpful that gets down into the nitty gritty of monitoring and the uh, equations to look at and all of those important things. And then also the practical aspects that nurses, respiratory therapists, specialists at the bedside, um, we can do and look at to make sure that our ECMO patients are cared for 
with excellence and that they can have good outcomes. So fantastic presentation. Appreciate your work and your contribution so, so much. You guys are doing a fantastic job over there. And so now we'll just go ahead and move into a discussion and question and answer session. Um, I know there's just a few of us that are online here, which is um, okay, we have definitely plenty of things to talk about and discuss and just kind of bounce back and forth. And so um, I have a couple of questions and just topics of um, just things that we can uh, address and just some practical things. I work with a lot of, um, I've worked at three total ECMO centers. Um, two here in the U.S. and then one overseas. I started out at UT Southwestern in Dallas and um, they have a, a large transplant VAD center. Learned so much in the beginning of my nursing career and then I went over to Cleveland Clinic in Abu Dhabi and worked with so many international nurses and physicians and respiratory therapists and really got to help introduce a um, cardiothoracic program, an ECMO pr program into that hospital with the um, staff that was there, trained a lot of the ECMO specialists there and they're continuing to do a fantastic job for the local Emirati population and then people who are living in that country. And then I'm over here now, um, worked actually four, four ECMO centers. I forgot about one, <laughs> but, um, but anyway, just with those experiences and I'm so thankful for being able to work overseas and just see different perspectives. And we don't necessarily operate the same way here in the U S as people do in um, the middle East or in Europe. And it was so rewarding for me to see that and to work with people from different backgrounds. Um, but one, um, just one question that I have for you, um, what is y'all's, your cannulation strategy when you're initially, and I know it differs depending on the situations, but um, when you're first going in to cannulate, and we'll just talk about COVID in particular, because I've seen different strategies and methodologies. Um, but when you're first going in to cannulate a COVID patient, what is your initial strategy? Um, is it FemFem? Is it FemIJ? Do you transfer over to a dual lumen um, catheter, the, the hospital that it came from last? We would typically do FemFem. And then as time progressed, we would go to a dual just for mobility. And so from your experience and where you guys are operating out of, and we have Enrico who's joined us as well, a perfusionist and incredible um, practitioner from Italy. But what is, what's your thought process behind that? What have you seen be successful? And what would you recommend based on um, what you guys have seen. I know the other day you told me that I think you guys have 12 people uh, cannulated right now. So just share a little bit about that and kind of what we should be aware of and looking for. And, you know, it's still developing a uh, concept and process, but what have you seen work well? Well, uh, we in the Korani Institute, we have a mainly femoral to uvular cannulation is because we have more experience and we have more available these cannulas. Sadly, we don't have too much uh, double lumen cannulas, so we are using more the femoral to jugular approach. And I think it's uh, easier in some ways because uh, uh, it's on, we can check two cannulas. It's easier to check if there is something chattering in the, in the ECMO. And I think for the nurses, maybe it could be easier to have two cannulas in, when you are moving the patient than only one cannula because the changes in the patient axis can change the position of the cannula as well. For us is the same. We have um, four patients cannulated right now at the moment and all of them are cannulated with a um, femoral jugular strategy. That, that is what we routinely do. 
we tried also uh, the dual lumen canola, but for this moving thing and uh, it's difficult to keep the uh, the right position of that catheter, so we prefer to use the double configuration with a femoral vein, uh, jugular vein. That is what we routinely do. And I have a question about that. Um, how often do you check the cannula position and how do you look for recirculation? How do you integrate um, ABGs, X-rays, images, uh, or I don't know, how do you calculate the recirculation? Uh, I, I used to assess recirculation daily. Uh, in the table I show here from my formula, I need to uh, measure the venous uh, oxygen, the postmembrane oxygen number in order to calculate the percentage of recirculation. And uh, also every day I try to see by ultrasound where is the cannula. I try to measure which is the distance between the cannula and the right atrium and uh, check the inferior vena cava surrounding the cannula. If there is uh, a stretching in the diameter in, in that size, I use the Doppler to know how much disturbance of the flow you have in the cannula. And of course, when you are assessing the volume and status of the patient, you, you can predict if the patient will go to chattering or not, and assessing it by ultrasound, it's easier to know where is the um, position of the cannula than x-rays. Because okay. in here in Hungary, we have patients with 100, 120 kilograms, 110 kilograms, and 180, 185 centimeters. So when you are doing the x-rays, maybe you will not get into the screen, the whole uh, abdomen as well, or the part of the abdomen, you will see the cannula. So I think it's easier and cheaper as well to do by ultrasound every day. I like ultrasound, so I could totally agree. I did okay, have, I have a question. More. Okay. Oh, sorry, go ahead, sir. I didn't mean to you interrupt. First. You first, no, oh, no problem. Sorry. Um, sir, I just had a quick question. I'm from your facility over abroad, um, what kind of uh, anticoagulation medications do you guys typically use and what is your preferred way of monitoring, you know, the patient's, you know, anticoagulation? And I'm just curious what kind of, you know, from your experience at your facility currently, what kind of, you know, um, adverse effects have you seen from, you know, those like what kind of bleeding, any intracranial hemorrhage or, you know, I don't know if there's any decreased rates at your facility, but I'm just kind of curious what kind of events you have seen. Uh, from the type of anticoagulations you've used? Uh, actually, we are using the sodium heparin. We are giving a bolus just before the cannulation, and after we are using continuous infusion of post sodium heparin with the uh, monitorization with the active clotting time. Uh, for us, it's much easier because we have a bedside active clotting time monitor. So with one drop or two of, of blood, we can measure uh, where we are. And till now, we didn't have too much clothing of the, of the ECMO system. With the uh, UK variable of the COVID-19, I think it's more prevalent to have uh, clothing in the membrane, even if the patient have an optic active clothing time between 180 and 170, even sometimes 200. Mm -hmm. uh, we can see in the, after one week, we need to replace the, the set because of clotting. Uh, about the bleeding, usually there is not too, too prevalent in our ICU, luckily. In the patients, if we, are, we need to do a tracheostomy after BV ECMO support, then we will see some complication about bleeding because after the, the tracheostomy, even using the percutaneous approach, the patient can bleed a bit more. There is uh, two serious cases of bleeding. Uh, these patients, even we needed to stop the anticoagulation at all and the clotting time remained high and the ENR remained high and the patient was bleeding. Uh, but this was due to infection of uh, multi-resistance uh, bacteria. Uh, we needed to give this patient the uh, reversal of the anticoagulation and try to have a balance between uh, anticoagulation and clotting. 
uh, for this, we have a uh, clot pro uh, thromboelastometry in the ICU to monitorize these special patients. We have a uh, more clotting uh, 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 risk or more bleeding risk. Uh, regarding the intracranial bleeding, mm -hmm. I personally use to monitor it by the transcranial ultrasound in patients with a good acoustic window. Uh, we didn't have up till now uh, intracranial bleeding complications and the patients which uh, we can remove from the ECMO support till now, they don't have a uh, neurologic deficiency after the ECMO support. Gotcha. We use uh, bivalirudin since the beginning of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, we were used to heparin, but we experienced so many you know, platelet, dro platelet drops, and we suspected HIT, so we uh, were already used from conventional ARDS patients. Uh, uh, we were confident with bivalirudine, so we started with bivalirudine, and we used to uh, monitor the coagulation state with the APTT. Uh, let's say it's kind of stable every time. We, have, we are not experience, uh, experiencing so many troubles with that. Uh, actually, we've seen um, more often uh, the clotting or it, let's say the malfunction of the membrane in COVID-19 patient as compared to ARDS conventional patient. But um, we used to, you know, keep an eye on that, keep tracking the delta P, the post-membrane uh, PO2, and to check the, you know, all these variables to see when is the right time to do to change out to do the change out to change the membrane and it's actually fine we are not experiencing so many uh thromboembolic complication or bleeding so it's working fine for now that's good awesome um enrico earlier you were talking about recirculation and how that's measured and monitored there's actually a um, calculation that can be done i can email that to you um, one thing that we do as ECMO specialists at the bedside is um, measure the pre and post gases. And if those numbers are coming closer together, then we know that there is some amount of recirculation. And then also the color change in the cannulas. Um, I had an experience the other day where our patient was continuously having suction events um, just with intrathoracic abdominal pressure. And our surgeon came in and um, advanced the cannula so that the cannula was higher than the hepatic vein. And um, our initial concern was for recirculation just with those cannulas being closer together with a bifem cannulation approach. And um, didn't have any of those issues. So do you guys have a um, approximate distance that you want the drainage and the return? I know I've heard seven centimeters. I've heard as long as there's no recirculation, do you have just a standard amount, especially when you're doing a FEM IJ um, cannulation? How do you, what's your threshold on that? Okay, uh, we over here we try to keep the femoral cannula right at the entrance of the right atrium, and then we move the, we move it forward or backward uh, to to and then assess again the recirculation percentage. That I I know about uh, Euro also the also formula to calculate the the recirculation, but that does not integrate the cardiac output, the native cardiac cardiac output. They changes everything. In fact. So this is why I was asking to you, how do you integrate all this data to get an idea about what the situation is? Because um, it's not a static situation. You can have hypersynetic uh, uh, patients and that changes the, the amount of recirculation. Then you move it and you check it again. So it's kind of empiric for now, but um, let's say we try to keep it to, to monitor it very often. And as soon as we have the clinical suspect of recirculation, we check it again. Yes, we as integrate echo, yeah, everything. Sorry. 
Yeah, uh, as Enrico says, that it's really dynamic, the recirculation in one patient, and it can change uh, in five minutes. And uh, regarding the hemodynamics, when you have a drop in the cardiac output, especially regarding hypovolemics, you can have a great amount of recirculation really fast. In patients with acute bleeding, with acute uh, uh, cardiogenic shock that you can see in patients with a COVID cardiomyopathy with a brutal reduction in the cardiac index and the cardiac contractility, the inferior vena cava collapses and uh, the amount of recirculation goes up really fast and you need to give fluid to the patient, start the inotropes, uh, change the position of the bed to improve the flow to the uh, uh, venous uh, cannula in order to try to save the, the ECMO system and in, maintain uh, adequate uh, oxygen delivery to the patient. I do have okay, a question. I, uh, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry, I just had a quick question, um, I guess. Um, this is uh, just pertaining, I guess, to, and it could apply to all three of you, but I'm just wondering how at each of your facilities, how you guys go about with VB ECMO patients, especially with the COVID-19 pandemic, how you guys have approached um, minimizing the ECMO support, you know, if you see, you know, patient has better lung compliance, more increased tidal volumes with time. I'm just wondering, do you guys have an institutionalized way of winning ECMO support, or do you guys just cater to each individual patient and cater like, do you just decrease the sweep or do you decrease the FIF2? Is there a certain way you guys handle that? Uh, in our centers, we have a total of uh, 57 beds. From those, we have uh, only 12 for now for BB ECMO. Mm -hmm. And usually we choose this patient that in the first two or three days in invasive uh, mechanical ventilatory support with higher P, we can see higher uh, plateau pressure, or there is high amount of uh, uh, cardiac uh, carbon dioxide that cannot be reduced by uh, the invasive uh, ventil ventilatory parameters. Those are the patients that we try to start the ECMO as soon as possible. And after starting ECMO, the first we are doing is protect the lung. We reduce the uh, in CO2 to 0.5. We try to reduce the PEEP to 10, or depending on the compliance of the patient, we can use a volume and control as well mm -hmm. to reduce the amount of tidal volume and reduce the tidal power. We use mm -hmm. usually starting to 5 milliliter per kilogram per predicted body weight for a tidal volume. If it's lower, better. In, uh, we saw in, so page, in many patients as well that the compliance is so, so bad that we need to uh, work with uh, pressure support, limiting the um, plateau pressure to less than 25 and the bigger amount of tidal volume we see in this patient is 10 milliliters, total 10 milliliters. And this can stay like this uh, by one or two weeks with only 10 milliliters of uh, tidal volume and this makes really harder the hemodynamic monitorization and the ECMO management because you will need a larger ratio of uh, ECMO flow over cardiac output to ensure an adequate uh, oxygen transport. It, these kind of patients are really hard. These uh, usually are the patients that are co-infected with the multi-resistant bacteria such as Acinectobacter or um, another a multi-resistant bacteria that make cows inside the lung and increase the metabolic rate really hard. These are patients with, the, you can see, it going to septic shock uh, or COVID cardiomyopathy. Uh, and these are really hard to manage. Uh, this uh, patient I show you with more than 80 A's in ECMO support got uh, three multi-resistant bacteria during the, the ECMO support. He got Klebsiella, he got Acinectobacter, and he got uh, Staphylococcus aureus multi-resistance as well. And in these three times, the compliance was really low, around two or three with 10 to 15 tidal volume. Mm -hmm. uh, and that means we needed to increase the ECMO support to ensure the appropriate oxygen transport. This may be a silly question, but 
um, what what is your strategy with or is your is your main goal to I know the main goal is to rest them, but how do you incorporate mobilizing and just keeping the condition of the body and the muscles and all of that um, appropriate for recovery after decannulation? Um, do you wake people up and have them participate as much as safely possible? Do you walk or mobilize your fem IJ cannulated patients? Um, what's your strategy with that? Well, because of the really long stay in mechanical ventilation and the ECMO support, usually where we have a therapist, uh, which is giving passive therapy in every day, at least two times per day. And uh, we try to improve the nutrition as much as we can. Uh, usually we are using mixing nutrition, parenteral plus enteral nutrition in order to ensure the amount of uh, kilocalories and proteins needed to the patient. And if the patient needs to be under relaxation and deep sedation, then the, at least we have this uh, physiotherapy every day, at least two times per day. The recovery, it will be slow. Uh, these are patients that after we can wake up because the compliance of, and the lung uh, uh, improve it and then we can awake the patient. After the awakening, they can take one or two weeks to, to wean in for the mechanical ventilation due to the muscle weakness. But we are usually as well monitoring lung mechanics uh, to know where is, which is the most appropriate uh, time to wean the patient from the mechanical ventilation. But in patient with more than two or three weeks uh, in deep sedation, muscle relaxation, and ECMO support, uh, this can take two, one or two weeks to recover before mechanical ventilation winning. And do you try to um, wean VV ECMO off before extubating, or do you extubate while they're being supported with VV and awake? Usually we try to win in from the VV ECMO before winning of mechanical ventilation because of the complication of having a really invasive uh, technique such as such a VV ECMO that can lead to more uh, infections or other complications. As well, it's easier for the patient after to do rehabilitation without the ECMO than with the ECMO. But uh, when the compliance is enough, we used to wake up the patient, even if it's with the VV ECMO support and start the rehabilitation until we can remove the ECMO and after removing from mechanical ventilation. We are using the mechanical ventilation as well as a kind of therapy after they are awakened because the diaphragm muscle as well is really weak. So you, you, we use the mechanical ventilation as a way of physiotherapy for the diaphragm as well to, to improve the function. What is your Another strategy? question. Okay. Do you guys Sorry. have a strategy over there that you're, you're using for that? Or is what? it basically the same? What was the question? Sorry. Oh, I was just wondering if um, Enrico, if you guys use the same um, methodology yeah. strategy for that. Yeah, just the same. It's okay. very similar. Okay. Okay, I have another question. Did you uh, use or have you ever used capnography on the membrane lung to monitor uh, the membrane lung? When we have available in the patient's bed, we use it. Okay. Because we know it's a really nice tool, especially in these patients to assess the hemodynamic easier. But also, I mean, I'm talking about um, that space shunt of the membrane lung itself. So. Yes, yes, especially I use because I, I'm, I'm a researcher and I used to okay. know, I try to calculate the physiological death space and I'm trying to calculate this new parameter to, to assess uh, pulmonary shunt to calculate the amount of oxygen we are losing after ECMO and the amount of CO2 we still need to remove from the patient using the VV ECMO. And the sandy oxys help as well to know the metabolic status of the patient, to know how many kilocalories we need to give to this patient to keep an appropriate amount of, uh, of uh, energy. Great. 
Unicode, do you use it? No, no, I never okay. have. Mm -mm. I think that's a European thing. I need to come over and sit with you guys. <laughs> this is the first time I'm hearing about the capnography attached to the actual membrane. Usually we haven't seen it to the, the ventilator, but not through the actual ECMO circuit, at least at my facility. Yeah. OK. Um, any other questions? I think I'm good. Mm -hmm. So um, just a quick in closing, if uh, you guys have just a couple of words to the clinicians and ECMO specialists who are caring for um, ECMO patients day in and day out, we see a lot, so we experience a lot. It can get cumbersome and challenging and um, emotions can run high at times. And so if you could just um, share a minute or two encouragement, um, if it's even a story that you've personally experienced, just to encourage us and um, give us hope to continue seeing the big picture and the uh, positive outcomes that there are, whether it's in research or patient outcomes, whatever that may be. So. Um, uh, Enrico, we can start with you and then we'll just continue. Well, I'm, I'm quite happy because today uh, for a patient that we had on ECMO for more than a month, uh, we weaned him yesterday, two days ago, two days ago. And so we decannulated and he is perfectly fine. Uh, and he is negative today. So he did uh, the swab twice and is uh, negative so we just transferred him and this is very very cool i'm very happy actually because uh, we he was awake in during the last period and we used you know to try to make him communicate with the fam with his family his wife his children so we did uh, video calls uh, and it was very uh, Everybody was so involved. Everybody was touched about the story. So it's it's winning. I, I used to say that if everything goes well, we win together. We, the patient, the family, all the professionals around the patient. So it's, it's a very good story. Uh, he's a very young man with a good life uh, in front of him. So. It's a good story. Uh, I will. Uh, I like to share it. Thank you. Thank you. I love that. And I like seeing, I can see the joy in your face and just mm -hmm. smiling and being happy for them. So thank you so much for sharing that. You're welcome. Anything else? I just uh, want to add, Nicole, you know, just for, and those for listening in, uh, you know, regardless of your position to always make sure you, you know, always advocate for the patient. And, you know, despite all the intricacies of the ECMO and managing patients on ECMO to always remember to talk to your patient and advocate for them. Um, and again, because this, this can be a very difficult time for them, you know, as you know, everyone's going through all the intricacies of trying to make sure that the patient is safe and that we're moving him along or her along and taking care of them that we always make sure that we also pay attention to their mental health as they go through such a stressful ordeal. Um, and it could be a lot of stress for the healthcare providers as well, because you may be seeing them day in and day out for weeks, months at a time. And so just remember that, you know, every, it takes a village, I guess you could say, to really help care for these patients and just take it day by day and really, you know, just be empathetic and try to help them out through this process as well. Thank you, doctor. Well, I would like to know to say that, well, you know, COVID-19 is not uh, a really easy pathway. We know that the mortality can be high and uh, using ECMO is not the end of the line. Uh, instead of that, ECMO is uh, re uh, hope for the patient. Uh, ECMO maybe is not a drug, ECMO maybe is not antiviral, but uh, ECMO uh, buys you time, buys you hope. There is a lot of people involved 
and for all these people, nurses, doctors, perfectionists, uh, psychologists, radiologists, etc. All the people don't stop getting involved with your patients. Uh, don't forget there is a living person in the end of the line and behind that person, that patient uh, with all these tubes, all these electrodes, there is a family and uh, maybe the statistics are not with us, but uh, the statistics are not all 100%. So our challenge is to be better each day and uh, give uh, the, all of the us each day to work together to make this patient get away of the statistics to make them uh, to see their family again, to be able to smile, to be able to raise their hands, to be able to walk and get out of the hospital. Because that's why we are here. That's why we are not sleeping in the nights. We are every day uh, doing research that are not easy and are not giving us money at all. Researchers used to pay to publish something, knowledge, which can be helpful for others. And after we are not getting back one cent of that, we are doing because we love the profession. We love the patient behind the disease. We love the family of the patient behind the disease. So don't lose hope. Uh, ECMO may be complex and is complex, but ECMO can save lives. All the people behind the ECMO will save your life, will do everything for you. And you can see examples of that every day, just like the patient I show you as an example in the conference. These patients, wow, how many times the staff was sad because the patient have a lactate in five, nine, 15, with the uh, oxygen really low and the, with the, the, the holes were, moods were, were down and even like that we continue to fight we spoke with the family we spoke to the patient keep moving keep fighting we can do this and uh, after 97 days in the icu now he can see his family every day in the internal medicine ward he can speak he can eat by himself using his hands to eat he can say thank you and he can say I'm alive and can continue with my life and I can go back to my home with my family. And that I think is the better reward, the best reward any clinician can get in the work. Thank you guys. Thank you so, so much for sharing those words of encouragement personal stories, personal accounts of, of what you've seen and how we can just be encouraged to move forward and um, keep cannulating and recovering and mobilizing and um, getting, getting patients better. So I just wanna say thank you for being present and um, putting everything together Dr. Francisco, all of the work that you did in your presentation um, and uh, allowing us to be a part of your teaching story and um, spreading ECMO knowledge and experience around the world. So I've just been honored to sit with you guys again and um, share just time with you. Enrico, it's so good to see you again. I know it's been a few months and probably a lot of patience and a lot of stories in between, but I feel like you're always a part of this community and welcome to contribute and talk and express anytime. Um, you, you share a valuable piece in, in the ECMO community as well. And um, Keith, always a pleasure. Always. <laughs> um, it was an honor to work with you in Florida and I love that we get to share ECMO stories now and kind of compare what's going on in program development and um, patient care. And I know we'll, we'll all probably be connected for a long time. So oh, yeah. you guys Thank are you incredible. And I really, really appreciate your time. Thank you for contributing. And um, 
and sharing with the world. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, guys, uh, thank you for this space. It's amazing. So we can share the knowledge or, or experience with, uh, with all the ECMO community. Thanks a lot, uh, Nicole, for this work. Thank you. See you Bye. guys later. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.